So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Zoom webinar. Buongiorno, benvenute, benvenuti. My name is Anna Maria Di Giorgio. I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in San Francisco. I am particularly glad to be here today and have the privilege to open this Zoom webinar to celebrate Dante Alighieri's 700th anniversary with a very special guest from Italy, Professor Alessandro Barbero. Thank you so much, Professor Barbero, for, for being with us today, despite your countless commitments. A note for uh, the American audience, you have to understand that having Professor Barbero with us uh, is like hosting a rock star. He has been defined, among other things, the most desirable of all, of all historians, a pop icon, an amazing popularizer. There are fine clubs called Alessandro Barbero, noi ti siamo vassalli, Alessandro Barbero, we are your vassals. Lots of Facebook and YouTube groups, especially of students and young people that have discovered the beauty of history through Barbero, extremely accurate and clear lessons, his, char his charisma and his irony. So we are very lucky to have the possibility to have a discussion with him today on his recent book, Dante. As you know, Dante Alighieri, our Somo Poeta, died in Ravenna 700 years ago. Italy has planned hundreds of initiatives to celebrate this important anniversary. And the cultural and diplomatic network of the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs is celebrating Dante through numerous initiatives. This webinar is one out of approximately 60 initiatives on Dante that our network will present this year. When the epidemic struck, together with my colleagues in North America, we have been looking for a way to put our resources uh, together in a common effort to offer our public the best online cultural program possible, despite the difficult times we were all living in. Following the motto, la cultura non si ferma, culture never stops. So it's very important for me to underline that this web series has been presented jointly by the IACs of North America. So please let me thank my colleagues Luca De Vito, IAC Chicago, Valeria Rumori, IAC Los Angeles, Francesco Darelli, IAC Montreal, Fabio Finotti and Paolo Barlera, IAC New York, Veronica Manson, IAC Toronto, Emanuele Amendola, IAC Washington. And a special thank goes to our embassy in Washington DC and our ambassador Armando Varricchio, who patronized this web series and for constantly supporting the activities of the IAC. Last but not least, let me thank our Consul General in San Francisco, Lorenzo Ortona, that is online with us today and would like to say a few words. Lorenzo, please welcome. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. Buongiorno a tutti. Uh, I am extremely glad to be able to introduce today one of the high level events dedicated this year to Dante's 700th anniversary of his death. Thanks to the coordination of the Italian Embassy, I was recall, as was recalled in Washington DC with all the Italian cultural institutes and consulates general in the United States, a wonderful program was put together. And we're very honored here in San Francisco, as Anna Maria mentioned today, to host author Alessandro Barbero, professor of medieval history at the Universidad del Piemonte Orientale. With his new book, Dante, Alessandro has given a very different and exciting way to look into Dante's life. And we're very eager to hear more from him today. Thank you as well to the moderator, Michael Subialka, Assistant Professor of Comparative Literature and Italian at the UC Davis, a friend of the Italian Consulate and a friend of the Cultural Institute here in San Francisco. As the Italian ambassador in the United States, Armando Varricchio mentioned, and I quote, Dante and his poetic vision represent a universal common heritage for humanity. And to this day, he is an unfailing source of inspiration and an essential instrument of dialogue among countries and societies." Unquote. The celebrations this year are particularly poignant since we're celebrating as well the 160th anniversary of diplomatic ties between Italy and the United States. And allow me to say that Dante represents an important component of our dialogue and friendship, beloved by American scholars and public at large. On March 25th, on the occasion of what in Italy we call Dante D, which is the day dedicated to Dante, all the US diplomatic network will organize on the US territory, a day dedicated to readings of Dante from representatives of the cultural, academic, entrepreneurial and artistic world. 
Many exciting events, therefore, in the months to come to honor our beloved Sommo Poeta Dante. And so without further ado, I wanna give the word back to Anna Maria, but allow me to thank her and her team and all the Italian cultural institutes involved that were just mentioned for today's special event. We're very excited, Professor Barbero, to be able to listen to you. And thank you again. And thank you, Michael, uh, for being here with us. Grazie a tutti. Buon ascolto. Thank you very much. Grazie, Lorenzo. Thank you. So coming back to our guest of honor, Professor Barbero teaches medieval history at the Università del Piemonte Orientale. Since 2013, he has appeared in many TV shows, becoming a TV star and bringing history alive for his audience uh, with his passion, ability to present the subject clearly, compellingly, all while remaining faithful to the historical facts, le fonti, and research, as is the case with this book on Dante. He is often able to connect, as you will see today, the past with the present, helping his audience to see themselves reflected in his books and to fully immerse themselves in his stories. In 2020, for La Terza Publisher, he wrote Dante, the book we'll discuss today, that will soon be published in English by Profile Editions. I take advantage of this introduction to thank La Terza Editori for their cooperation today. I'd like now to introduce Professor Subialka, today's moderator, Thanks once again for your help and availability, Michael. Professor Subiak is Assistant Professor of Comparative Literature and Italian at UC Davis, where he researches modernism with a special focus on the intersection of literature and philosophy. He also has published on Renaissance and early modern Italian literature and thought. He has taught Dante in many of his academic courses, and he has declared to feel a burning passion for the Divine Comedy. So before giving him the word, a quick note, at the end of the conference, Professor Barbero will answer some of your questions, probably the first five questions we'll receive. You can write a question in English or in Italian in the Q&A. And now, without further ado, I give the word to Professor Subialka, and thanks again, Professor Barbero, for the honor you granted us being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to be here and an honor to be um, in such august company. Um, um, much has already been said to introduce Professor Barbero, so I won't add too much more, but I think that it's uh, no exaggeration to say that one could go on almost endlessly talking about his many achievements and how much he has done. I do think it is worth highlighting, um, just for our audience, the fact that his uh, historical work has spanned a tremendous, um, a tremendous and perhaps enviable range for those of us who are, are fellow academics. Um, although I shouldn't say that because today we're talking about Dante and if a poet has taught us anything, it's that envy is a sin. So I'll refrain there and simply say that um, spanning from ancient uh, Roman history and the fall of Rome all the way up through the Napoleonic Wars, we have a sort of series of um, historical accounts that do this amazing job of tying together narrations that make them accessible with, um, as, um, uh, as we were just hearing, the, the sort of facts and the sources that make them um, historically accurate and um, academically important. And um, that ability to weave together those things is probably also speaks to Professor Barbero's um, other hat, uh, for which he's also very well known, of course, which is his um, creative fiction and narrative writing. Um, his uh, first novel, in fact, uh, won the Premio Strega in 1996. That was Bella Vita e Guerre Altrui di Mr. Pyle, Gentil Uomo. Um, and since then, he's continued to write a, a sort of half dozen other novels having historical dimensions of their own, as well as working on radio and television and his more recent uh, fame as a YouTube celebrity. So he's been all over the place doing all sorts of things in a really exciting way. And it's so interesting to see him bring all of this erudition and all of this um, narrative capacity to telling the story of one of the most interesting and most famous figures, certainly in the Italian and also in the European and, and, and world literary and cultural tradition. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have him here. But I do want to add one last thing before I sort of launch into our conversation, because of all of his achievements, the ones that sort of speaks perhaps the most to me is actually one that he got in 2014 um, when he was awarded by his uh, university where he teaches the Università del Piemonte Orientale. Um, the award of Professore del Anno. So we're very privileged to have the Professor of the Year here with us today to share his wisdom, to share his erudition, and also to share his excitement for, um, for Dante and for um, 
the medieval culture and the world that Dante inhabits, because perhaps that is one of the most interesting facets of this particular way of telling the biography of Dante, is that in a sense, it actually gives us more of a vision of the world around him, the culture that he inhabits, and the, the sort of perhaps to us moderns, strange social structures and political and economic realities uh, in, in a way that not only helps us understand Dante's life, but also helps us understand all of the works that we read and appreciate so much of Dante's. Um, so I wanted to start out the, the conversation um, just by kind of asking a little bit about uh, why you chose Dante after this kind of uh, incredible arc of so many different um, historical and biographical works. Um, obviously, this year is a particularly important one given the, um, the, the anniversary that we're celebrating of Dante's death and all that he's accomplished. Um, but what, what brought you to, to this de decision to, to write on Dante? Well, uh, well, good, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you much. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, your Mr. Consul. Um, shame on you, uh, Michael <laughs> and Anna Maria, for raising such high expectations about me. Uh, I, <clears throat> as you, as everybody is understanding, uh, uh, my English is not perfect. So I hope we shall go on uh, with not too many problems. Uh, the first questions I grasped, that's already something. So uh, I, try, I now try to answer it. Um, what brought me to it? Well, I guess we are here to tell the truth and not to try masking it. So the naked truth is I, I work with a great publisher. Uh, I work with a great publisher, Giuseppe La Terza, um, who is now, it's now the third generation of this family company, uh, which is one of the biggest, uh, in an intellectual sense, most important uh, uh, publishing houses in Italy. And when I say he's a great publisher, I mean one thing. He's, he knows his authors and he's able uh, to tell his authors, I've got an idea, I think you should like it. Uh, and, <laughs> and in fact, uh, one day, three years ago, four years ago, about four years ago, yeah, uh, he told me, Alessandro, uh, I've got an idea, an idea, I would like to share it with you. I think you could be interested. Uh, how about writing a life of Dante? And the fact is, of course, every Italian knows Dante. Uh, we all read him, we all read the comedy at school. Uh, we all like him which is a big thing because usually authors which has uh, compulsorily read at school, uh, you often leave school uh, uh, thinking I never, I, I don't want to have anything to do with him anymore. This doesn't happen with Dante. Uh, he's part of our tradition, he's part of our identity, uh, so to speak. And so, you know, uh, of course uh, I have a personal relationship with Dante as every reading Italian has, but I, I never thought about his life. I, I never thought about writing a life of Dante. Uh, but the fact is, I started to think about it. And the more I thought about it, the more it dawned on me that it would be very, very funny to write about Dante's life. Of course, this means uh, it is a historian's book. Uh, I'm no literary critic. Uh, I would never be able to, to explain why it's so important to read Dante and to know Dante. But to an historian of the Middle Ages, uh, the idea of writing the life of an individual about whom we don't know everything we would like to know, but still he is one of the very few individuals in his time um, who has personally told us what it meant to him to fall in love as a child with a, with a girl he consecrated all his life after, after that. Uh, we know very, very many things about him. We have very many sources about his life. So writing a book about him, not about a great poet, about a man of the Middle Ages, 
who also happens to be our greatest poet. Now, that was uh, a chance I jumped at when it was proposed to me. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's interesting to hear you say that because as I was reading the book, of course, one of the things that struck me is precisely on the one hand, how surprisingly little we know about Dante compared to some of the, the famous contemporaries around his age. If we think of Petrarca or Boccaccio, um, we, we have very little uh, information about Dante in certain key moments of his life. Um, and there's some chapters where you uh, work through different hypotheses that um, scholars have offered about what's going on in his life and where he was, even where he lived, um, for example, during his exile. Um, how did you how did you go about doing the research to determine how to tell this life story? Well, you know, the great thing in being an historian of the Middle Ages is that usually uh, on any subject uh, you can uh, try and see every possible source. That's a, that's a delight uh, that is denied to our colleagues, uh, for instance, contemporary historians, uh, or even historians of the 19th century, when sources are so abundant, uh, you will never read everything you could possibly read about your subject. Being an historian of the Middle Ages mean you get yourself, uh, you, you begin your work, okay, and your first task is to make a list of every possible source, and then you proceed to find and read every single possible source. Now, of course, the literary historian is struck by the fact that we know so little about Dante, but the historian uh, is struck by the fact that we know so many, many facts. Uh, and more, even more, we have different kinds of sources. I mean, we have Dante, Dante's own testimony. You can't, of course, always believe every single word Dante writes about himself, but it's up to the historian, exactly, to criticize sources um, and witnesses, um, even when the witness is your main character. Uh, and then we have uh, we have people who in Dante's time, uh, a few years after his death, began writing, began uh, uh, looking for witnesses, uh, interviewing witnesses uh, in order to write down everything that could be remembered about him. Because it was obvious to everybody in the literary world, I mean, but also in the world of power, uh, of princes, uh, of popes and cardinals, everybody knew that Dante had been one of the great men of their time, that, it, he, that he would be remembered, uh, and it was worthwhile to write his life. So, and, then, and then you have uh, archival sources. Uh, I mean, the kind of, of source which is produced when uh, somebody goes to, 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 the, to, an, to the notary uh, to write down uh, selling a house or, or marrying a couple, uh, you have that kind of sources too. So it's a rich array of sources uh, and which is most gratifying to the historian putting himself to this task. Uh, for centuries, uh, my predecessors uh, went into the archives in Florence, in Italy, all over Europe, looking for sources about Dante. You know, even in the Middle Ages, after Dante's death, when somebody in the Florentine archives uh, found uh, any piece of paper or parchment uh, with any insignificant information about Dante, and they hurried to write, to scribble a little hand in the margin to signal, to signal that there was some information about him. And they even wrote Dante, uh, or even scribbled a small portrait of himself with the Lord crown. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, for centuries, everything about Dante, about his family, his ancestors, his descendants, <laughs> has been found in the archives and now conveniently published in a single big volume. <laughs> this means 
very many sources and it's very easy to find them. You have them in your computer. Uh, and, uh, and this is a great help uh, for research. <laughs> Yes, the, it's true. Everything is, is digital and accessible now in a different way. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, it, it, I've always kind of wondered this, at, at what point, and it seems it's a little difficult maybe to know for certain, um, but it seems that Dante's fame grew obviously during his life, and we're not exactly sure what year maybe he was publishing and circulating some of his works um, from the Commedia, for example. But when do you think um, Dante started to become that kind of famous personage, um, going from being a kind of uh, political exile to being a famous cultural figure? Um, how does that trajectory occur in his life? Well. Of course, um, uh, we should say, first of all, that the last part of Dante's life, when he lived in exile, and when he wrote the comedy, is the least documented and uh, less well-known part of his life. Uh, we don't really know when he began to write, write in the comedy. We have educated guests. Uh, six, seven, I mean, uh, in, at the beginning of the 14th century, uh, 1306 or seven, uh, but we have some landmarks. We know that in 1315, Francesco da Barberino wrote, uh, uh, ah, there is a book by Dante Alighieri, <laughs> uh, which uh, with a, a lot of good things about, the, about hell. Uh, <laughs> and, and in a few years more, 1316, 1317, uh, people began to quote verse from the purgatory. Purgatory, purgatory, how do you say it in English? Purgatory. Purgatory, okay. I would never have been able to, to arrive to it. Purgatory, okay. <laughs> uh, and, so, and so we know that Dante published hell and then purgatory, even though we don't realize exactly what it meant to publish at that time. Of course, they didn't print. Uh, so publish, but they knew that an unpublished work is different from a published work. Uh, we guess that the writer decided now this is uh, over <laughs> and, and others can read it. Uh, up to now, I, I was the only one to know what I've written. Now I want the opinion of others. And what is difficult to understand to us is that in a world where uh, physical circulation and circulation of ideas and books was in our eyes so difficult, uh, hampered by many, many difficulties. In fact, people went around a lot and books went around, ideas went around, and news went around. Uh, and so the fact is Dante decided now people will begin to read hell. Uh, and in fact, people did. Uh, and while he was writing uh, Paradise, Purgatory, Purgatory, okay, <laughs> went around too. <laughs> and, uh, and second most important thing, people read and thought, this is great. Never seen anything like that. Uh, and, and it's not in Latin, uh, it's in our language. Uh, some schoolmasters uh, frowned. Why is it, is it not in Latin? Uh, it's not a good thing. Uh, and in fact, uh, had it been in Latin, everybody could read it at once in England, in France, in Germany, in Sweden. Uh, every uh, remotely interested writer, uh, reader could read it had it been in Latin. But Dante decided to write in Italian. Uh, it was his great fortune uh, for the future. Uh, at that time, uh, Italians, uh, Italian literati were, were divided, uh, but most realized at once that this was a very, very great achievement. Uh, so much so that when he died, and uh, while hell, he finished and then published it, Purgatory, he finished and then published it, it looks like he began circulating paradise uh, in single cantos or groups of cantos, because when he died, 
the idea was widespread that, uh, oh God, he hasn't yet finished it. <laughs> We've read uh, a good part of Paradise, but the last 13 cantos uh, are still missing. And uh, what are we going to do? Uh, and the fact is somebody uh, told to Dante's sons, Jacopo and Piero, well, uh, you, you knew your father very well, uh, you knew his ideas, uh, you, you can write verse, uh, you should finish it because we can't stand not having the whole of paradise. So of course, lots, millions of people in Italy had never heard about Dante, but everywhere, in every city, in every princely court, there were intellectuals and noblemen who had, and noble women, who had heard about him, who had read him, and who knew that he was very, very, very great. Uh, in a couple of generations, uh, this notion would uh, be widespread in Europe. At the end of the 14th century, Geoffrey Chaucer will write in his Canterbury Tales, uh, one of the tales uh, uh, tells a tale which is taken from hell, called Teugolino, uh, and, uh, and the character who tells the tale uh, then tells, well, if you want to know more, uh, read Dante, the great poet of Italy. <laughs> so at the end of the 14th century, uh, intellectuals, writers uh, uh, in, uh, in England, in that small faraway country, lost in the northern seas, as Italians at the time would see it, uh, even there, uh, they knew about him. Uh, so his, his notoriety was spreading in this kind of what we would, I guess, today call viral, right? He went viral in the old fashioned way, <laughs> so slowly, a, a more sort of not slow motion. Not for any more for the moment. <laughs> But um, it's it's very interesting. Also, you were talking about his his sons and the role that they played there. Um, and one of the things that I appreciate about your biography also is it gives a very rich sense of the family and their lives and kind of some of the questions of where are they when he's in exile, who actually, who stays at home, how does that all work? Do you think there are, um, what, what would you say is interesting about Dante's family um, and his family life that you think people maybe don't usually know or are you not usually aware of? Or did you discover any sort of facts that you think sort of change our way of thinking about Dante's family? Well, the, discovering new facts uh, is a hard task when in Dante studies, of course. Uh, if I should stick to this point, uh, I should say um, everybody knows, but it was never really, nobody really thought about this simple fact. Um, both of Dante's surviving sons, Jacopo and Piero, uh, received uh, during the last years of Dante's life, uh, ecclesiastical, how do you call them, benefici ecclesiastici, uh, benefices, perhaps you can mm -hmm. say in English, benefices. You know, how the church functioned at that time. Every church was rich, of course. Uh, the church of Ravenna, for instance, Dante lived his last years in Ravenna, okay? In Ravenna, you have a powerful church uh, with much money, uh, much money which comes in every year, and that money is shared be between many, many priests and simple clerics uh, uh, having a, a right to a share of, of that money uh, is called a benefice, okay? A benefit. Ah, anyway, you understand what I mean. Uh, so both of Dante's sons received ecclesiastical benefits uh, during the last years of Dante's life and were in Ravenna, where Dante spent his last years, in Verona, where Dante spent the <laughs> years before that. In both cases, Dante was the guest of the Lord of the city. And how things went, we know that to get to lend a benefice, which is not quite a job because you had nothing to do. <laughs> you simply get the money, <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, and getting that uh, means being very well acquainted with the city's lord, with his court, uh, with the noble families, which own the right to present candidates to these uh, uh, plump jobs, let's call that like that, uh, okay? So this means Dante, worried like any good father 
he worried about his children and he wanted to be sure that while he was still there and still had an influence and had patronage, he could assure a living for them. Uh, so it's not simply the fact that they had uh, those jobs, uh, those benefits, everybody knows that, but just think about Dante, uh, worrying himself about that uh, and maneuvering uh, as any good Italian father would do uh, uh, to have a, a good place for his children. And he did that also for one of his daughters, Beatrice. We find Beatrice, uh, a nun uh, in a nunnery in Ravenna again and again. You didn't enter like, like that. You had to have patronage, support, official support from the court, from the Lord. Uh, and this means that Dante spent his last years not just struggling to, to finish paradise, but also struggling uh, for his family, uh, which as, as any good Italian father would do. <laughs> Yes, a struggle which is um, certainly complicated by the fact that he has such a tenuous um, and uh, difficult political standing in, in Florence. And I wonder if you maybe want to talk a little bit also about um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this biography is the um, really rich vision of the complex sort of political and social um, existence that Dante is part of in Florence um, in, in the Middle Ages. And the, um, the Comune and the way that the government is structured, Dante's own participation in that. I wonder um, if, you want, if you wanted to just highlight or, or, or pick out um, a couple of features of this kind of Florentine political world that Dante was part of um, that you think maybe would surprise or that people aren't familiar with, uh, what do you think are some of the most interesting facets of this, um, this period of, 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 of Florentine and then also Italian uh, history? It's a big issue, and uh, I would like to begin by uh, remembering that for the e English edition, Profile asked me to write a very long introduction <laughs> explaining exactly that, because in Italy we can say, well, perhaps people will not be surprised by the fact that city-states were independent, uh, that they had political parties, uh, uh, hating one another, uh, uh, even the names of Guelphs and Ghibellines uh, are known to every Italian who reads, I mean, uh, and who went to school. Um, while uh, it was the idea of the profile people that in England and the States, nobody would know anything about that. Of course, of course. Um, my translator, Alan Cameron, a Scotsman and a friend, uh, had real problems with the terminology of political life to the point that he refused to speak of communes because he said that it's a technical uh, word, but in the general public, nobody will understand what you're talking about. So he decided to stick to city state or republic, uh, much to my irritation because <laughs> I, I felt it was not like quite the same thing. But anyway, so he, he decided it. Um, well, the point is, Every city in Italy was in fact an independent state. Uh, to be a politician in Italy meant to be a politician in your own city. And uh, the, you, you, be, you decided to interest yourself in politics as everybody could do, every citizen could. Some cities had a more, um, less people involved, let's say. Uh, Florence was a so-called popular government uh, or wide government, they call it governo largo, a wide government. So this means literally thousands of citizens took part in the governing of the commune. Uh, councils, commissions, groups, juntas, uh, and all that changing very, very quickly, very fast. Uh, so thousands of people taking part. But if you were a well-to-do citizen like Dante, with much time, because he was, he was the son and the nephew 
of man, of working man, not in the sense of uh, working with the hands, uh, let's say businessman, okay, businessman. His father, grandfather, all businessmen. Dante was a young man who had inherited a small fortune. He was not uh, incredibly rich, not at all, but rich enough to live as a, re as a true citizen should do in his own eyes, which means uh, not going every day to, to, the, to your office. <laughs> no, no, no business, okay. Uh, I, dad bought land, he bought farms, uh, peasants will work for me, <laughs> and every year they will come taking me my own oil, my own wine, my own wet and, and money, <laughs> and so uh, I can live as a gentleman. He was no gentleman since his family was not ancient, but his friends were gentlemen and he wanted to be a gentleman. Uh, now a gentleman lives at his leisure and he does what he likes most. And Dante likes like the studying, like the poetry, like the books. Uh, and uh, about at the age of 30, he discovered that he liked politics too. Uh, but to be I will not say a politician, there were no professional politicians, but to be a citizen who is deeply and uh, constantly involved in the government of the city state uh, meant, of course, that you had to declare your allegiance. You had to be a Guelph and not a Ghibelline because Guelphs won in Florence. They had won since a long time, uh, the party of the church, uh, the, the the other party, Ghibellines, Ghibellines, how do you say it? Okay, uh, in Florence there were like talking about Ghibellines in Florence in Dante's time was like talking talking about communists in the states today. Uh, once upon a time they were there, but then uh, now they are, they are no more. Uh, but still. Some people are obsessed uh, uh, with this thought, okay? <laughs> and that's it. So you had to be a Guelph and Dante was a Guelph. There was a party, an organized party, Parte Guelfa. The Italians in the Middle Age invented the, the idea and the terminology of political parties. Parte Guelfa was an organized party installed in the center of the city and uh, uh, obsessed by ideological orthodoxy. They made lists of possible Gibbelins, possible enemies uh, to keep clear of the, any government position. Then, then they had so a one party system, but being a one party system, how to divide uh, the, the, the booty? Uh, I mean, because uh, to, to be in politics meant, meant uh, you want to be there uh, to become rich yourself, to make your friends rich, your party, your family, and to destroy your enemies. Everybody had friends, everybody had enemies. Uh, a city state like Florence uh, had a government which uh, managed uh, enormous wealth. It was a very, it was the wealthiest city in Europe. Venice perhaps was on the same level, but hardly at the time, I think. Uh, so, they could not agree about how dividing it. Uh, and so the party split into two enemy parties, whites and blacks. No ideology there. They were all Guelphs, all enemies of the emperor, all friends of the Pope and the Roman church, no ideology, but they hated one another because everybody wanted everything for himself. Uh, and Dante chose the losing uh, party. <laughs> when the, the blacks uh, took power in the city, they expelled the whites. And Dante, who had been one of the important politicians uh, and a wealthy, a reasonably wealthy citizen, lost everything. He's lost, he lost his house, uh, everything he had, his books, uh, his papers, wife, children, uh, social standing, uh, everything. He found himself out of the city where he had lived up until then. He never came back and he had to make for himself another kind of life. Yeah, it, it, this political situation is so complex. There's a, a really interesting passage where you talk about the way in which um, 
there's a kind of degree of everyday violence on the streets that we're not familiar with in our in our contemporary world that um, even even rich or powerful or well known people were subject to sort of um, uh, sudden and unexpected um, violence in these uh, conflicts between families and groups and clans, as, as you call them, right? Uh, it, it's a, a sort of different uh, picture of social fabric from what we're familiar with today. Sure. And that is strange because from another viewpoint, their politics, their idea of politics was not so different to ours because politics, politics then as now meant uh, meetings uh, and somebody getting up and, and speaking, trying to convince the voters uh, and it meant a party line to follow uh, and, and you vote, uh, sacred vote, public vote, uh, elected uh, committees uh, and all that. So it is all very familiar, but violence erupted into the tissue uh, with a frequency that would be uh, unacceptable today. Uh, even in our 20th century experience, uh, uh, the eruptions of violence, uh, fascism, for instance, or even Nazism, it meant uh, a brief moment of violence. We overthrow our enemy, we take power, and then we revert uh, to something which has the appearance of a normal life. Of course, the dictatorships uh, maintain a level of secret violence, but not in the streets. The problem with medieval Italian politics is that uh, the normal rules uh, of, of a normal political life could be interrupted every day by somebody getting out armed uh, with followers uh, in, in, to the streets and trying to overthrow the government or simply to coerce uh, the government into doing something uh, we need, we want, and you will do it, or you will risk uh, civil war, okay? Uh, now, of course, they were not unconscious of this uh, problem. Uh, the whole idea, I, I have not uh, told that politics were even more complex than we told. Uh, uh, there is another split the people, and the great, the people, I mean businessmen, every businessman from the great banker to the shop, to the petty shopkeeper, uh, all of them thought that violence was not a really good, th a real good thing. Uh, uh, all of them thought that violence was the, the privilege of the, of the knights, of the noblemen. Uh, and this is in fact so, uh, which is surprising to us in our societies, killing somebody will not easily happen to members of the ruling class. Actually killing somebody, I mean, uh, or kicking uh, or beating, physically beating somebody. Members of the ruling class will not usually do it in Italy or in the States. Um, and generally speaking, the middle class will not do it. Um, let's not talk about the police, that's another question, uh, but uh, Usually we expect that beating, kicking, um, fighting in the street uh, or uh, beating your wife for uh, also, of course, or maiming or killing somebody you hate uh, autom automatically uh, presents you, marks you uh, as an outcast in a way. Um, perhaps I'm too optimistic, but no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. It was quite the reverse in the Middle Ages. The ruling classes, uh, and especially those classes which ruled not just by being wealthy, but also by being old nobility, uh, they, there were, they, there were, they knew violence, they used violence, they had no, nothing that uh, told them that violence is not uh, a good thing for somebody who presents himself as a gentleman. Being a gentleman meant be going to the street armed and being very ready, very, very much ready to, to, to take to, the, to your uh, weapons uh, and attack and kill your enemies. Uh, so violence was very much, very well spread because there was no social stigma on it. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting. You mentioned um, something else there that I think is is interesting. The the kind of um, Dante's relationship with his wife, which is also political in the sense that um, he's there's a complexity there because his wife comes from the family of the other side of the Guelphs, right? Um, which is, I suppose, why she's able to stay in Florence um, after he's sent in exile because she's protected by her family, as it were. Um, what, you know, I, I feel like we don't hear very much about Dante's wife, Gemma. Um, what did you find of the, that we think is interesting about that relationship? And what do you think, um, what do you think it tells us about Dante's um, sort of political situation and his also um, his sort of his life, his picture of the world? <laughs> In fact, Dante's marriage to Gemma is a nest of mysteries. Um, it is very unsatisfactory uh, because we, in fact, we, we really know next to nothing. I mean, uh, you know, we know, we know for a fact that they were married, okay, uh, and that she was a Donati, so very great noble family uh, from the other party, yes, <laughs> from the opposite party, but also neighbors. They all lived together in the same uh, small, par tiny part of the city. Um, and we know that they had uh, many, many children. Uh, I've mentioned them. Uh, they had, at the very least, we know three males and two daughters who came to adult age, which means that statistically, we must suppose that some other children died before. So it was a, 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 significant, a significant marriage, a significant part of Dante's life. And that's all, everything we know for certain. Okay, um, of course, we know marriages were arranged by families. They had nothing to do with love. People expected, of course, it would be, it was a good fortune if man and, wo and, and, and wife uh, uh, went along together well, uh, if they liked uh, one another, it was a good thing. Uh, everything expected it, but it had nothing to do with love as the passion which drove Dante to write the Commedia uh, in order to, to honor Beatrice who had died so many years before uh, to whom he had promised that he would write about her something that had never been written about no other woman. Uh, that was outside, out of marriage. Uh, marriage, we know, but not for certain it, it was not a happy marriage because Boccaccio tells us that the one good thing in Dante's exile was that he was at last able to say goodbye, farewell to Gemma and he never saw her uh, anymore. In his, uh, well, now Boccaccio is not always a fully reliable source, of course. Uh, somebody had probably told him that, uh, but who can say? Uh, so, in fact, we don't know, we don't really know whether Dante found in Gemma a good wife and whether Gemma found in Dante a reasonably good uh, uh, husband. Uh, and we don't even know, and that's the most worrying part of the historian, when they marry, which would not be so important were it not for the fact that the single document uh, with a date on it purporting to tell us the date of their marriage. It's a document written many, many years after. Uh, it's a copy of a copy, okay? Uh, and the date is impossible. Dante was 12. Uh, so usually literary critics say, oh, well, in the Middle Ages, everything was possible. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and they say, well, it was not really the date of his marriage. It was a promise and it was not uncommon for families to decide that once grown up, uh, my son and your daughter will marry, okay. But the fact is that document is the document which was done, redacted, written down on the very day of the real marriage, uh, when the husband went uh, and took the wife to his house. Uh, so if, if we have to believe, if you are to believe to, that, that really happened on that day uh, when Dante was 12. So something really strange happened. 
and I would like very much to know it. Um, on the other side, Boccaccio says uh, Dante married after Beatrice's death when his friends, uh, his family, his kin uh, tried to console him and it would be more, far more reliable uh, as an hypothesis. Yeah, it, it, it's, I mean, it's just fascinating to hear you talk about all of these kind of mysteries, right, that we get um, and having to kind of do some detective work, in fact, to piece together what we really can, uh, what really makes sense as we're kind of creating a narrative of the of, of Dante's life. I think it's, it's really fascinating. Um, we're, we're getting a lot of questions from the audience, and so I'm going to, I'm going to kind of uh, integrate some of those into, into what I'm asking here, um, because uh, there are a number of them that I think uh, kind of speak to what we're, what we're talking about here. Um, so Dante, obviously, when he went into exile, was moving around a lot. Um, there's a kind of question here, which I think is actually really fascinating about the practicalities of that. I mean, how does a person move from place to place in this period? How long do they stay? What are the, I mean, does he first have to be invited before he leaves, say, Verona and goes to Ravenna? Um, does he go on short trips? How much do we know about that? How much can we know about that? Oh, well, we, we don't really know very many things about that. Um, in the first part of here, of his exile, uh, we should not forget that Dante was still a member of a political party, uh, albeit a political party which had been expulsed, violently expulsed uh, from its city. Uh, but political parties uh, subsisted in exile. They were able to subsist because they had friends, they had allies, uh, they had funds. Uh, so for a couple of years or so, Dante would not have had the problem of uh, where will I live and uh, what will I eat uh, for supper today? Uh, because he was part of an international organization uh, supported by many powerful princes or cities. Uh, but then Dante uh, was not able to keep along for a long time with his friends, with his party comrades. Um, he decided they were not really the people he had uh, expected them to be. He decided they would never really help him to get back into Florence, which was his only obsession at that moment. Um, we may also speculate that his party comrades decided that Dante was not such a good uh, companion <laughs> in their fight. Uh, and so they decided to dispense with his counsel, uh, which was coming uh, fast uh, and loud. Uh, and uh, so, so he found himself alone. Happily, he was uh, a politician of some renown, uh, which means uh, he had experience. He had experience in writing official letters. Uh, in writing treatises. Uh, it was a kind uh, of experience of ability, technical ability, which was very much requested. So it was not difficult to find princes uh, who had uh, small courts, who had clerks, uh, uh, who needed help in their chancery, uh, advi political advice and all that. So uh, we can reasonably um, expect uh, that he was uh, often invited and he could even choose perhaps. Uh, so he could stay for some months uh, with Marchesi Malaspina and then uh, for a while with Conti Guidi. Um, I don't think he ever really uh, had to think, oh God, uh, they are going to be uh, not satisfied with me and where will I go later? Um, he could choose but he could not choose the single thing he would really like, uh, which is coming back uh, to Florence. He had to adapt to a different world uh, and to a world of princes and feudal lords to, to, which, uh, to whom he adapted very well. One has to say this, uh, this politician of the city-state, uh, this faithful servant of a popular wide government of a government of businessmen, uh, when he found himself in exile, 
he discovered that he could go along, get along very well with princes and noblemen and feudal courts. Um, and he even wrote to the extent that businessmen, after all, it's no use to try to uh, discuss important things with them. Uh, princes and nobles and the noble women and princesses he says, are the kind of people to whom I can give good advice. Convivio, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so he adapted uh, quite well uh, and swiftly to a different environment, but still embittered by the fact that this was not what he really wished for. What he really needed was to be called back into Florence uh, with many excuses and to be crowned with the poet's laurels in Florence, and that he never had. Yeah, the centrality of Florence actually maybe leads to there are a couple of questions that relate to the question of language, uh, particularly with the choice to use um, the Volgari, right, the Tuscan tongue um, in in uh, the Commedia. Um, and uh, we, so one question is asking, you know, what, why did he choose um, the Volgari instead of Latin? Um, and uh, perhaps is, is there some sort of political aspect to that? Is there that is that related to his kind of uh, desire to return to Florence. Um, and then there's also a question about um, how the, the text, um, how the comedy is um, received and transmitted and translated into what languages it gets translated in the early, um, in the first hundred or so years after its publication. Uh, well, why did he choose to write in, in, in Volgare? Because it was not even called Italian at that time. Uh, Dante is one of the first who realized that all Italian dialects throughout Italy are the dialects uh, of the same language. Uh, but he has no name for it. Uh, well, he writes in Volgare for two reasons, I think. First of all, Dante is no humanist. The next generation, Petrarca, and even more the next generation later at the end of the 14th century will be thrilled and excited by the idea we could write Latin, but the same Latin that Cicero wrote, the same Latin the ancients wrote. That will be the thrilling uh, up-to-date thing at the end of the century. For Dante's generation, the thrilling thing is still to be able to write in Volgare because uh, until then, everybody had written in Latin. Uh, with no idea of uh, competing with Cicero, they wrote in their own modern Latin, uh, and we were very happy with it. Uh, but writing, writing poetry, I mean, uh, in Italian, let's say that, uh, was a novelty. Dante tells it in one of his first works in the Vita Nuova. Uh, he tells, uh, uh, until recently, uh, writing uh, of lo about love was possible only in Latin. But now new poets have appeared who write about love, who discuss love in Volgare, in Italian. Uh, and that was the thrilling thing to his generation. Which doesn't mean that he didn't write in Latin too. He, wrote, he often wrote in Latin. But now the problem is the public you are addressing. When he wrote learned treatises like De Vulgari Eloquentia or like the Monarchia, when he wrote for intellectuals, he wrote Latin, of course. Uh, but he also wrote, he was a popularizer, <laughs> uh, divulgatore, as we say in Italian. He liked to speak to a different, very, more varied, varied people, uh, public, and, uh, and then in this case, he chose to write uh, in Italian. So the fact that he wrote uh, the Commedia in Italian means he was not talking to clerks, to intellectuals, to his equals. He was writing to the equals of Francesca da Rimini, uh, to young ladies, uh, young married or unmarried ladies who were able to read, of course, but who had no Latin. I say Francesca and Paolo, of course, uh, to everybody who could read, but who could could not necessarily read in Latin. Mm -hmm. How about uh, translations? Uh, well, uh, I must confess that I never really uh, mm, 
learn uh, to remember in which languages the comedy was first translated. I seem to remember Catalan uh, and Spanish and perhaps French uh, during the 14th or even 15th century. I mean, uh, translations were not so early as Dante's fame. Uh, I, I guess uh, that Dante was known to foreign writers and poets uh, who had some acquaintance with Italian and who could read it in Italian. But that's almost everything I know about this subject. I'm sorry for Robert Vanni who posed this question. I can read it too in the Q&A, uh, but uh, I, I don't remember exactly when, when and who first translated it. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I can't tell with that at all either, <laughs> but it's, it is an interesting question to think about. But as you're saying, I mean, when you think of someone like Chaucer talking about Dante, um, there's, there's probably also familiarity with the Italian language. Um, that, that I guess so, I guess mm -hmm. so, because in fact, uh, uh, Italy was a, a, a great source of books, uh, of novels, uh, of tales, uh, for writers, uh, it will be uh, until Shakespeare's time. Uh, and that meant uh, in writers often uh, had some Italian. Courts too had some Italian uh, because of relations with, with Italy, uh, with the Pope, with the church, uh, and with Italian merchants and bankers uh, were important uh, for European courts. Uh, um, at, at Shakespeare's time, not just Shakespeare, uh, knew some Italian. Queen Elizabeth could speak Italian. Uh, later, it will not be the case, but up to the beginning of the 17th century, Italian was in fact an international language, so rather well known by some groups of people. Yeah, and actually touching on the, the point you just made about the church, um, there are several questions here as well, I noticed that are about um, the, the kind of balance between politics and religion in Dante's life and in the Commedia um, both. Do you, do you have any um, comments on the, the role that these two play in terms of their relation to each other? Well, I, I would say this. Um, in our world, uh, uh, in Catholic countries, for instance, uh, uh, it's hard to make the difference with one's opinion about religion and one's opinion about the church. Catholics in Italy usually will support the church. And uh, it, if, we, if somebody um, speaks uh, ill of the church or the Pope or cardinals, he usually is not a religious person. I'm simplifying enormously, of course, but I think I'm not so far from the mark. In the Middle Ages, that was not the case. It was simply not the case because everybody was religious. Everybody was Christian. Of course, you find sometimes some people who has some doubts or who is said to have some doubts about the existence of God. But uh, really, it's really very hard to find atheists in the Middle Ages. On the contrary, it will be very easy to find people who don't believe the church's teaching, uh, while still being very, very religious, heretics, uh, and even more, you will find people who are perfectly orthodox Christians, but who are very outspoken about their opinion of the church, of churchmen, of the papal court, and all that. Uh, it was a free age. Inquisition was at its beginning. Uh, discussion was still very free. Uh, it began to be not so free in Dante's age, but it still was. Uh, and it was completely possible for a very good Christian, an Orthodox Catholic, to think horrible things about the Pope, about the Papal Court, about the Church at large, and all that. So, so religion uh, was not necessarily um, a problem in politics. The church was. Uh, the church took part in politics, uh, and so it was absolutely normal in politics to find yourself uh, to, to, to think about, well, now the Pope is going to do uh, this and this. Uh, do we agree with it or not? And if we do not agree with it, uh, are we going to fight the Pope? Uh, a perfectly orthodox, Catholic and the Guelph city as Florence, 
will actually be in war against the Pope uh, 50 years after Dante's death, uh, La Guerra degli Otto Santi. Uh, oh, uh, and, so, and so, of course, in politics, we will find parties who follow the Pope's lead, um, but who will not follow it blindly. Uh, and we, you will find groups or parties or cities or princes who will happily make war against the Pope uh, without thinking uh, for a moment uh, of that, that, that they are not good uh, Christians uh, just for this uh, slight uh, and very common fact that they are fighting, uh, militarily fighting uh, the Pope, uh, the papal forces. Oh, I mean, th th this is so this is so rich. I'm loving all of this. Um, but I, I see that our dear, the director of our uh, Instituto Italiano di Cultura, Anna Maria Di Giorgio, is, is back on screen. And I take that as my subtle cue uh, <laughs> that we should let our let our esteemed guests take a break now and we should uh, let our audience go back to work. But I want to thank you so much for this really riveting conversation, which I've really enjoyed being part of, and for the book, which um, is being translated into English now, um, I think, and so will be available this year uh, for our English reading audience as well later this year. Is that right? Yes, as far as we know, Professor Barbero, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, profile uh, Publishing House uh, will translate it in art cover uh, the book into English uh, within the next month, probably. That's we found an English version online from digital, a digital version of the book, uh, an ebook by Profile Publisher. So probably you, you might find it online. It's on our website too. Um, so the, the people can uh, uh, can read it in English for sure. Um, so uh, thank you very, very much, uh, um, Professor Barbero, for uh, the honor of being with us today. Thank you, Michael Subialka, once again for your moderation. Thanks uh, to our Consul General Lorenzo Ortona, to Michael Lee. Grazie. Erika, grazie, Professore, davvero un piacere. Grazie. Complimenti. Grazie. Ho oh, oh, orde di fan che mi scrivono in privato. I've got many fans writing me privately asking, please, uh, other questions or uh, please say hello to Professor Barbero. It was a pleasure to, to hear him today. So thanks again to our embassy in Washington, D.C. and to all the people who connected with us today from Italy and U.S. showing these uh, incredible interests. Uh, I would like to remind you two important uh, events related to Dante. The IAC Washington has organized the next webinar of this series on March 3rd with Professor Lino Pertile entitled Dante's Ulysses Today. And remember, as the Council General was saying, on March 25th, we will celebrate Dante D or Dante Day with many events. So please follow our websites, uh, YouTube channels, social networks, uh, subscribe to our newsletter to keep up to date. So I hope this webinar has offered you a short pause from worries and anxiety in these hard times you're all living in. Please stay safe, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you for your attention. Grazie ancora, professore. Grazie a tutti. Buona giornata. Grazie a tutti. And thank you, Michael. You have been a great, great moderator. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Grazie. Grazie. Aver organizzato questo. Grazie, console. Arrivederci a tutti. Buonasera. Grazie a lei. Grazie, professore. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.